No, art is possible by committee. Um, and at the committee as well, a whole bunch of people can go out and improvise stuff that looks like theater. Basically all you need is some traffic patterns and some game rules and some kind of image of what it is that you're going to do. And it turned out to be Harold. Hi guys, today we are going to talk about a format. The format is a little bit the way you are going to use the magic of improv to make the show interesting. Every format has its own philosophy, its own approach to the technique of improv. So first I will tell you about the format of the Harold, then about the history and the philosophy of this format, and then finally I will give you a few tips on how you can make a good Harold. A Harold counts between 6 to 8 players in average and lasts between 20 and 30 minutes. You start with the suggestion phase where you establish the theme of the Harold. You start with a word from the audience. Then the improvisers will explore the theme through very very short scenes. Each improviser steps forward when they have an idea without any specific order. In some versions you make a monologue, others pretend to be at a cocktail, others pray the god of the word in question. Uh, to get started with a Harold, can we have a suggestion of anything at all? Surgery. Surgery, thank you very much. Stainless steel, absolutely, perfectly free of any sort of microbes and That disease. smell that only exists in a hospital. This body is stripped of all its skin, so all of its muscles and tendons and ligaments are exposed. There are a lot of variations. The goal here is to play with the ideas so you have enough matter for what follows. Without any consultation, the group will feel when they don't have any more ideas. The players will then turn around and start what we call the first beat. The first scene is played between two or three improvisers, then another scene, completely different, starts with other players. Then a third one. The scenes A, B and C may Make the first beat. The players then have the character they will keep during the rest of the Harold. Please note that the distribution of the players between the scene is not prepared and that the transitions between the scenes are done naturally. This edit must be as seamless as possible. The players never agree, they must feel when the group is ready to move on to something else. At the end of the first beat, we make a transition game. Historically, this game was decided before, so the players knew the rules but they didn't stop the show to explain them to the audience. The audience had to figure them out. Today we tend to do a game of the scene instead. It's a scene in short. The idea is still the same, is to have a break between two beats. This game generally involves all the players and stay connected with the theme of the Harold. For example, in the conference room, which is a game where the players have to invent a marketing campaign for a product, if the theme of the Harold is opening, then the product may be an oyster with an easy opening. You stick to the theme. After this transition game, you start the second beat. We will see the sequel of the scenes A, B and C and we will explore further not the stories but the ideas and concepts. We are going to expand the universe of the scene. To give you an idea, you can look at the sequels of some movies. In the first Terminator, a big bad robot from the future tries to kill the mother of the future leader of the rebellion. Great. Terminator 2, you explore the concept. What if the humans were using Terminators 2? So get a fight robot versus robot. Terminator 3, I won't talk about it. Or what the hell, let's talk about it. It's the same thing with Ghostbusters. The gender here is not what is interesting to explore. We don't care about the gender of the heroes. It's not part of the DNA of this universe. So sorry, but it's not really interesting. In Terminator Salvation, the fourth one, you explore the idea and how is the war in the future. And apparently it goes WAP! Explosion! What? If instead of that Terminator 2 had been about the family life of Sarah Connor, which is a little bit complicated after she killed the Terminator, well, it would have been consistent with the story, but that's not really what is interesting to explore here. In the second bit, you can be in a different place. Chronologically, the scene can be before or after the first one. Most of the time, you keep the same characters, but not always. Just like during the first beat, the edit between the scenes are done naturally. The little difference here is that you are going to see connections between the scenes. The characters won't meet, but you can mention them. Or an object of the scene A will end up in the scene B or an event of the scene C will impact the scene A. Or more simply, the expression of one character will be said by another one. Well, we'll have connections either from the story level or from a theatrical point of view. After the second beat, you have another intermission game. Then you start the third and last beat. Now you don't have rules anymore. The scenes can mingle, cross over, you can have A and B together, even the three of them together. You can reuse a game of the scene of the second beat and explore it even further. Well, everything is permitted to finish it with a big bang. And voila, that's a Harold. And if you have never seen one, I guess it's still not very clear for you. And that's normal. To really get it, I need to talk to you about the philosophy of the long form. 
The Harold has been created in 1967 in San Francisco. The first group to play it is the committee, founded by Alan and Jessica Myerson. Two former players of the second city of Chicago who have worked with Dead Close. Dead Close has been a member of the committee and is going to invent the Harold with them and mostly with Shana Halpern. Back then, the format was 45 minutes long. That then evolved from troop to troop until it became what I have just described to you. And why do we call it a Harold? Because the guy in the troupe, Bill Matthew, had watched the movie A Hard Day's Night where George Harrison says uh, What would you call that uh, hairstyle you're wearing? Arthur. So Bill Matthew made that joke again. Okay guys, so how do we call this uh, show? I call it Harold. Okay. By the way, Dead Close always kinda hated that name, the Harold. So saying yes and it's not always a good thing actually. Long story short, the Harold is because of the Beatles. The Harold is what we call a long form, which is different from a long format. The long format is an improvised story that lasts between 30 minutes and one hour and a half. The long form is a term coming from the school of Chicago to talk about a 30 minutes format that explores a theme. This exploration is done through games of the scene, just like what I explained in the episode about organic improv. But beyond that, it's hard to define the philosophy of the Harold, because if this format was a Pokemon, it would be Eevee. Each troop has a different version of the Harold. Some skip the introduction, others add a conclusion, you can start the second beat with the same scene, and the Harold has many variations itself. If you remove the intermission games, it's called a triptych. If you start with a monologue, it's an armando, but it's still the philosophy of the Harold. So you should see this format as a family, a family of formats with roughly the same structure, trying to explore a theme through different stories. So that's what makes it so great actually, because it's a very versatile format, so it's never twice the same Harold, for sure. <laughs> I presented the Harold like this. But actually, a good Harold, it should be like a sphere. From the opening, ideas will emerge and grow during the first two beats and then connect in the end to encompass the whole thing. So you really don't want to mess up your opening. To make a good opening, you need to develop a very strong group mind. You will riff off the ideas of each other, but not randomly. What you're looking for are the ideas that will give you the premises of a scene. If the original suggestion is plumber, instead of exploring the theme by saying plumber leak information, you will immediately say plumber information. That's how you explore an idea real fast. Then, just like in an organic improv, you will try to find the first unusual element and play with it. For example, plumber, leak, betraying informant, obvious private detective, blind bus driver, politician with moral standards. You see that with the detective, we had an unusual element. From there, the players use the mechanism of if this is true, what else is true. With a few words, the improvisers will discover a game that they can reuse later. Here, a scene with professionals who don't have the expected skills for their job. They will keep exploring for a few minutes and give themselves ideas of games for the next three scenes. Then it will be very easy for them to find the starting platform of their scenes. In the first beat, you establish the premise of the scene while using the yes and mechanism. Then you will find the game of the scene. The key here is to identify the first unusual element of the scene. The job was simple. Infiltrate Big Jimmy's poker game and acquire the microfilm hidden in his necklace by any means possible. There was only one problem. I have no idea how to play poker. When it happens, it's very important to highlight it with a very strong reaction. We call that framing the game. That's when you switch from the logic yes and to if this is true, what else is true? In more details, these logics work through three types of propositions. Either you amplify. All right, wise guy, raise a fold. Yes. What? Go fish. Either you explore the idea and its consequences on the world of the scene. You go fish. Do you not know how to play poker, boss? Shut up, Vlad. You don't even know how to drink. You don't know me. Basically, you give credit to the idea by justifying it. Either you react the most honestly possible. We call that reacting at the top of your intelligence. Da, you put gun on table. Spin gun That's around. Russian roulette. You hold it up to your head. Definitely Russian roulette. And you pull the trigger. Stop playing Russian roulette, you idiot. You are idiot. If an idea is weird, don't ignore it. Highlight its weirdness. Why? Because authenticity maintains the interest of the audience. These propositions can be done by the players on stage, but also by those who stayed off stage. They can make an intervention just to support the scene. Well, that's how you move forward in the game. Then we stop the scene when we feel that the players can't amplify anymore. Ideally, you stop on a funny moment, not when your friends are struggling. Then we make a scene edit in a way that has been agreed between the players. There are many ways to make an edit. It depends on the troops. Well, you understood that there are various schools. If most of them agree that the first beat should be about establishing the characters, the situation, the conflict, etc., 
The second beat is a critical moment. The school of the second city is more interested in relationships. They preach for the authenticity of the game and the situations. The motto is kinda, it's fun because it's true. So don't try to be funny, try to be authentic. The fun will come naturally. And everybody's looking for the laugh, 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 and get to the next moment and get to the next beat. And that's really not what this art form is about. What you know? is it about? Um, I think it's um, a really about uh, exploring and heightening the relationship between two people. The UCB troupe is more game-oriented. If you watch their show Ascat, yes, with four S's, and the version of the Herald, you will see that they are really after the game of the scene, because it's more fun for them. For UCB in the second beat, you want to explore the previous game. You don't want to do the same scene again, and you certainly don't want to move forward in the story. You will just transform the previous game a little bit. And to do that, there are two main techniques. Either you make a time jump, where you see the same characters later in the story, in a world following the rules that have been established, either you make an analogy. You completely change the characters, the place and the action, but you keep the same principle. Finally, in the third beat, which is quite short in general, the idea is to make funny connections without forcing it, to give a sensation of togetherness to the show. There are a lot of techniques to conclude, one of them is to make a callback, just like what I explained in the episode on storytelling improv. But to fully understand the Harold, I need to talk about the mini plot. I talked in a previous episode about the three act structure. This structure is what we call the arc plot. It is the great matrix that you can find 90% of the Hollywood films. It's everywhere, and some say it's even killing the movie industry. So whether you want it or not, you know this structure. It's when you follow a hero who will succeed or not against an opponent. Unlike the long format, the Harold is part of another structure called the mini plot. You know it, it's the plot line of movies like Pulp Fiction, Love Actually, Magnolia, Sin City, Snatch, Babel, etc. Very simply, you follow several characters who have their own objectives. They can have connections, but none of them is the main hero. But most of the time, the players want to be the main hero of the story and follow the structure of an arc plot. And it's not possible, you cannot make a story with six main characters the same way you make any other story. Right? So if you try to tell a story with a Harold, you need to reduce the plot of each character to the minimum. Because the most important is not the story, but the ideas and how far you can stretch them. And especially if you keep it simple, it will be easier for you to remember the initial ideas. The differences go a bit further. You will have more passive or simply reactive characters. A big hero, it makes decisions. Choice. The problem is choice. A mini plot hero, it kinda let the chips fall where they may. Another consequence of this passivity is that the conflict will mostly be internal and interpersonal. There are characters who struggle with themselves rather than with the external world. Because we don't have the time to introduce it. Boys, get to work. Please would be nice. Come again? I said a please would be nice. Get it straight, Buster. I'm not here to say please. I'm here to tell you what to do. Finally, we often have open endings in a Harold. It doesn't mean that you don't solve the problems, but it's okay to leave a few questions unanswered, because we don't have the time to answer to all of them. And that's all for the best. A Harold is more about asking questions in a funny way than giving definitive answers. So go watch Harolds about terrorism, racism, or the Pokemons. It's always going to be funny and interesting. That's it on this very peculiar format. If you want to know more about it because I haven't covered everything, Will Hines talk about it for 5 hours very well. Don't hesitate to comment on this video if you want to ask any question or share your own tips to make a good Harold. Don't hesitate also to like or share this video or subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet. Uh, see you around, go watch some improv even better, do some, goodbye.